Good morning, everybody. Let me uh, go ahead and call us uh, to order. A um, couple of announcements before we uh, actually get started. Alec, is this loud enough? I heard last week that a couple of people had a little bit of trouble uh, hearing the pearls of wisdom that uh, were dispensed, and I want to make sure that nobody has that problem today. They may have to just eat the microphone. That could be the issue, because listen to that. I'm right here, and then how much of a difference when I'm that close? It's interesting. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, first is uh, this coming Wednesday, we start back with our Westminster Academy program. We'll have uh, Sue Tully Trout from Belmont uh, teaching uh, one of my favorite authors, Walker Percy. Um, how many of you know Walker Percy? Not enough. Um, we'll be reading his book, uh, Love in the Ruins. Uh, Walker Percy uh, is a Roman Catholic, was a physician, ended up becoming a psychiatrist, and I think one of the most important Christian novelists of the second half of the 20th century. His first book, The Movie Goer, came out in the 19, early 60 or 61, won the National Book Award. Um, but uh, this one I, I, I like uh, even better. So I uh, encourage you to come and be part of that if you'd like. Then next weekend, um, we'll have an opportunity to welcome to the congregation uh, documentary filmmaker Carolyn Crowder, who uh, has done uh, interviews with Presbyterian ministers or their families who were uh, involved in the civil rights uh, movement. And uh, Knox Walkup in our congregation, his 103-year-old mother, uh, is featured in the film because of the work that her husband did uh, when he was pastor at First Press Starkville. Um, but very excited to host that. We'll uh, be here next Sunday afternoon from 4 to 6 uh, or Monday morning from uh, 930 to 1130 and hope uh, you'd go ahead and, and come and be part of that as well. Uh, we're so grateful to have Kim Hinton uh, again this week. Uh, last week, he talked about the temple, and this week, he'll talk about uh, where was Jesus buried. And uh, when you do that, you have to talk about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, uh, which is over the traditional spot of Calvary and the empty tomb. So um, I am particularly grateful that this week, uh, Debbie Tate is here because it's Debbie who uh, introduced me to Kim. They were backdoor neighbors as kids down in Murfreesboro. And um, these guys were down in Florida getting a tan last weekend when we were freezing here, but uh, but you were on Zoom, okay. Okay, and we welcome those who are on Zoom uh, today. So we're grateful. Kim, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, God. Is, a bit, is this going to be better, I guess? Okay, okay. Well, first of all, good morning. Oh, come on. Let's try this again. Good morning. Good job, last class. Um, wonderful to be here. Uh, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, something that came of interest to me when I was in a architecture school at the University of Tennessee. One of the things we study is architectural history, and I was and I was saying, okay, so where where is the temple that Jesus where Jesus visited? Where is that in architectural history? And it's not included. I thought, well, why is that? It says because they're not sure it ever existed. So that's why I'm tying together. Let's see here. Let's go. All right. So wait a minute here. A little technical stuff. Okay, tech guy. <laughs> But that guy is the one, you know, the most important person in the room is him. I don't know how to advance it. See, it's not advancing. Okay, it's this. Okay, so I have my sources. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, I talked last week about the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Uh, and that and and this is the way it looks now. It's a flat plateau. Uh, I'm not going to go over everything that was talked about last week. Basically, 
Uh, it's controlled by Muslim group, uh, and it has the Dome of the Rock, which is the gold domed structure. And then to the right of that is something called it, the uh, uh, it is the Al Aqsa Mosque. That's the dome, and the dome is built over the rock, the rock of sacrifice, uh, and that is uh, reportedly where the ark of the covenant rested and upon that was built Solomon's tomb this is probably a rendition of Solomon's tomb it's thoroughly described in um in the old testament i mean it, it dimensions everything and i went over some of that last week it was also destroyed uh and after it was destroyed by nebuchadnezzar uh, the Jewish folks were taken into what was called the exile. And when they come back, they build a second temple. And it's much less glorious, but it's built to be kind of the same arrangement, the same size. Okay, so we move up to King Herod, who is mentioned extensively in the New Testament. I mentioned Solomon's temple. Then there's the second temple. There were repairs to it. And then there was Herod's temple, okay? So all the structures were located over the rock that I mentioned. And the latest version is this, the Dome of the Rock. A lot of changes, tremendous number of changes. So that's what we have now, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But I'm going to go back to Herod's temple because that's the one that Jesus probably visited. And it was extraordinary. Uh, not only was it a man-made man acropolis, but it included what was the time the largest and probably tallest structure in the Eastern Roman Empire. No small thing. Colossal building that Herod built over the top of the earlier of the second temple. And this incredible wall around it. Um, I learned so much about that from a book by Josephus, the first century. Jewish historian, and the description of this is incredible. And because it was so tall, it was a it was a place where you, I'm sure that Roman soldiers were always at the top looking out, and it made a great great um, location for uh, for them to view any coming armies or whatever was going on. And in it, uh, the structure was much taller. The Ark of the Covenant had vanished much earlier, so it was not in the back chamber, but basically the, the structure had two chambers, what they call the main hall, and then the Holy holy of the Holies uh, chamber in the back. And, and that is allegedly where the rock was located as it had been in the first and second temple. And there was a veil or curtain between that and, and only, I think, only the highest ranking uh, Jewish priest or whatever would be allowed to go into that back chamber. Uh, there's documentation of the, of the temple in, on Roman coins. So this is the, at the time of Jesus, the temple mount is on, is kind of the, the, the rectangle you see in the middle. And he comes into Jerusalem. You know, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a big time, wonderful Palm Sunday. And this is another view. Now, this is looking, the temple is in the middle on top of the uh, Acropolis. Uh, but you see this long structure uh, across the top, and then there's steps at the bottom. And this is what it looks like today. So you kind of get an idea of in the past and today. Now, it's it's really important because as recently as January the 3rd, uh, the Minister of Defense of Israel went on the Temple Mount, and that caused a big stir because uh, basically my Jewish guide said, we don't need to go up on the Temple Mount until the temple is rebuilt. They pray against something called the Western Wall. And that's where they gather and they pray, but they rarely go up on top. And the Muslim authority that controls the Temple Mount doesn't want them on top. And so when this person and a group went on top, that was very 
it was strange. It had reactions, everything from people being very excited about this to people worrying that would cause an enormous riot. Of course, Jesus wasn't very happy with the temple either. And, you know, got really mad about the thieves and people selling things to then go up uh, at high prices to go on top and present something as an offering. And of course, he made this prediction, all will be torn down. Uh, you know, this, and, and, and the disciples were like, gosh, look at these structures. So as, as we come to the end of Jesus' life, there was the Last Supper. This is another version that I really like. Who's the bad guy? Well, we know. <laughs> I think I messed up. I think I messed up really bad, really bad. And of course, Jesus is uh, holding bread, and there's, there's a cup. He's then taken to Pilate, forced to carry the cross, and buried. Uh, reportedly, well, in, in the scripture, it says he was buried outside the, the gates of the city. Maybe at this location, uh, which is the traditional location uh, and, and where a structure will later be built. Terrible scene. Uh, there was a movie made that, called The Robe many years ago, and it's where, you know, the Roman soldiers were rolling dice or whatever with Jesus' robe. And one of them, portrayed by Richard Burton, you know, becomes the uh, hero in this movie, which I watched as a little kid. And he is absolutely, he has this robe and it terrifies him and it, 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 he can't get it out of his mind. He later becomes a Christian in the movie. Also, while Jesus was on the cross, uh, he was sorry dead, but the, the Jews wanted him to make sure he's dead that night. And so, you know, they wanted the Roman soldiers to break his legs or something. And a soldier pierced Jesus' side. This is a depiction of that event. It's not in the it's not in the normal Bible that I think most of us read, but in the apocryphal, uh, he's mentioned as a guy named Laginus. And so we see this picture. Actually, a close up, you can see his name written in Greek right above. And later, he also becomes Christian because of a saint holding that lance or you know, javelin or something. So the end is there. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn down in two from top to bottom. And that's that curtain. And that's symbolic enormously symbolic in that when that happened, there's no longer a mysterious connection to God. He's available to everybody. Uh, and uh, at the time, Joseph, uh, the, the person that offers the tomb, may have caught Jesus' blood in the Last Supper cup. Now, that's, you know, that's all of these, uh, and as I'm saying this, Many of these things are controversial. They're not thoroughly resolved. Some of them are myths. But he may have done that. And, of course, that ends up being, it was the cup that was used at the Last Supper, and that's now known as the Holy Grail. And it may have been, you know, incredibly beautiful or incredibly simple. He asks Pilate for the body and offers a new tomb. Of course, they carry Jesus away. Ter terrible event, and they lay him down. They place him, and, and then in this depiction, you see maybe Joseph offering a tomb nearby. By the way, there's also something I read in Esquire magazine when I was in high school about there. Was, the title was, Were You There When They Photographed My Lord? <laughs> the wildest, and it was about this thing, the Shroud of Turin which is a cloth thing. And when it's unfolded, it's really, it's big and long, very controversial because many believe that it has the depiction of Jesus on it on the right side. That's another mystery to solve. Where is the tomb? Well, according to what I showed you earlier, it's located where the little arrow is outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And 
it says very clearly in the in scriptures that the, that near the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden was a new tomb that had not been used. And so the premise is that he was buried on the high part you see on the left and buried in the tomb to the right. Now, I mentioned where he might have been crucified, and it's this hilltop, and the garden would be below. Well, in early Christianity, you, you imagine that, you know, people they were so upset, you know, it was a terrible time, but they identified the place and probably would go to it, visit it, try to take a look at it, remember Jesus. Uh, and this is around AD 33. So the tomb may have been as depicted here with a, a rolling stone that's rolled across the entrance. Uh, and Golgotha in AD 30. Well, Christianity starts growing. The Jews were later, later be run out to uh, really run out in AD 70. But by, you know, after Jesus' death, you know, Christianity started spreading and, you know, it was it started becoming big as a big movement. And Nero thinks that the Christians, you know, were responsible for the burning robe. And so he has serious persecution of Christians. I mean, just nasty stuff to try to dispel the religion. So mentioned a few years later, the Romans, who are just sick and tired of being abused by the Jews, um, they send, the, the emperor sends his son to Jerusalem to take care of it. And he takes care of it. They destroy the temple. Uh, and it's absolutely a disaster. I mentioned this earlier. This great structure is turned into rubble. Uh, and I mentioned this too. Uh, Solomon's temple had been destroyed on the ninth day of the 11th month. Herod's temple is destroyed on the ninth day of the 11th month. It's a holiday, not a holiday, more of a event. And then we know what happened in New York, 9-11. I think that's very chilling irony. Of course, uh, Titus goes back to Rome. He's a big shot. He took care of them, brought all the stuff back to Rome. So did the temple really exist? Well, you know, this is this is real. This is a piece of sculpture on an incredible monument in uh, Rome. And you would think, well, <laughs> they really did capture. They tore up something and they captured a lot of booty and brought people back. They brought a lot of slaves back. And many of them were forced to build the Colosseum, which originally looked like this. I mentioned Josephus because he's the historian that really covered all of this. And this is a copy of the book. I, I urge you, if you're interested at all in, in a, kind of the time of the Bible, it's a fabulous read. So this is where, this is where um, the temple was. And this is the way it is now. Now, where the walls are located is in dispute. And what you see there, the structure you see is a Al-Aqsa Mosque. A bigger view here, you see the uh, Dome of the Rock. And I mentioned the Western Wall, which is where the Jews pray, and they hope that the temple above will come back. Well, of course, that will require the removal of the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, one of the three most important uh, locations in Islam. Uh, Hadrian, of course, Christianity, of course, um, back to the Romans. The Romans, of course, tear up the temple, and the Jews basically just scatter everywhere. Diaspora, I think, is the term. Um, but Christianity starts really becoming strong in Jerusalem. The Jews have left. The Romans, you know, are still there. But, you know, Christianity starts spreading. It's, it, it, was a, it was growing in power in Rome. And uh, that one of the emperors, Hadrian, shows up. We're not exactly sure when the Bible was actually, the first New Testament was actually written. Uh, but when Hadrian shows up, of course, this image of Jesus, uh, when he shows up, uh, they, are, they are praying. Uh, 
the Christians are praying at this location, and they think, well, that's maybe where the tomb was. Uh, this shows the location, maybe, and I mentioned Golgotha, maybe. Again, looking at the tomb from above and a close-up of it. Well, Hadrian, he is, he is tired of this, and he, he wants to fix this situation. He wants to remind everybody the Romans are in charge. Don't mess with us. That includes Jews, and that includes Christians and any other group. So he has a temple built on where the Temple Mount was located. He builds a temple there, and he also builds a temple to uh, Venus or Aphrodite. He builds it on top of where Jesus was buried. He has the place filled in, and he builds a temple on top, and he does it for many reasons. Uh, but the main reason is, look, I know you guys think Jesus was buried there, but stop that. Uh, and to remind you, we're going to build a temple on top of it for the goddess of love or lust. And that's what we'll create. And you just have to live with it. And then the real persecution happens. You know, three, 300, Christianity has really become strong. And it's, it's, it's a terrible time. And, and the, the, the great persecution occurs, you know, 300 years after the time of Jesus. And Eusebius covers this in much detail. And then along comes Constantine. He becomes emperor. Uh, why do, he, he, he wants to end the persecution of Christians. There are actually several rulers of the Roman Empire. And he doesn't become the emperor until 312. He becomes emperor because uh, he has a vision of seeing a cross in the sky. And with it, the phrase... In this, you will conquer. In this sign, you will conquer. So he has crosses put on all the Roman soldiers on their outfits and on their shields. And he wins a battle and becomes the emperor of all of the Roman Empire. Uh, but he, you know, that's the end of Christianity having a problem. Now it's endorsed by the top guy. Uh, it doesn't really become the official religion until 380. Uh, the, in this uh, timeline, the persecution ends. <laughs> and this is interesting because Constantine, you know, he's the head guy, and he says, okay, Mom, what are you doing next week? Uh, Helena, uh, why don't you go to this place called Jerusalem and find out what the big deal is? You know, if everybody likes Jesus and they're praying, they're Christians, Go down there and check it out and establish something. Uh, by the way, uh, soon after, he really moves the Roman Empire to Constantinople. So there's his mom. Of course, she probably didn't look quite that young. And she visits, and what she establishes is something called the Holy Sepulcher. The Temple Mount, as you see, has been abandoned. Uh, so Hadrian built this temple. Well, she has it torn down. Let me go back. She has this temple that was built over where Jesus may have been buried, crucified. She has it torn down. This is kind of a cross section. Remember I showed you that earlier image where there's a hillside and then it drops down to a little tomb. Well, this is a cross section of what was built on the site, and it doesn't show the same topography, and I'll explain that in a minute. So the Hadrian's tomb was this, and this is what Helena, Helena destroys it and builds a brand new structure. And it's enormous. It's actually a shrine, a dome over what's called the sepulcher or a tomb, and it has this incredible basilica in front of it. That's where people gather and start to have church. You know, first one, the first real church, I guess, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And where is it located? Look at the little arrow. So it's a long way from the, uh, from the Temple Mount. 
Uh, it's a church and a basilica. Well, the basilica is destroyed, and today, really what we have is just is the tomb and a structure built beside it. And this is it. Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And it's been renovated and it's been partly destroyed over the ages. Uh, this is a historic picture of it. And but people have documented what's inside it, what's located. And it was built over where Jesus may have been crucified and where he may have been buried. Two things. This is a historic picture. I'm pointing out the, the funniest, weirdest thing about this place. Yeah, a picture of it being renovated. They put roofs on it. You know, it's been changed. Uh, this is when I visited a decade ago. It's hard to believe. Uh, looking at the front entrance and there's a plaza. But it's not really, it's not really wildly beautiful and fantastic and huge like St. Peter's or even the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and it's controlled by different groups. No Protestants, okay? No Protestants. And they each have like an hour a day that they kind of could go in and worship. And then, you know, okay. And I went there and got in the tomb with the Roman Catholics. I just kind of snuck in and did this and they, nobody cared. And I got in and went into the uh, tomb to see it. And uh, and we were there. And then, and then the Greek Orthodox come rolling in with, you know, the incense and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and like, you guys leave. And we all left. You know, it's next. They have it the next time. But what's really funny is these different groups, they argue, argue, argue. They just hate each other. It's just wild. <laughs> they can't agree on anything. They can't agree on a ladder that was placed in a window in 1854. That window, that ladder. No one knows why it's there, and no one will move it because they can't agree on the ladder. Isn't that crazy? There you see it. You know, it's up high. <laughs> That's just so silly. But it's a fabulous structure. The tomb is in orange. Uh, and actually, the tomb itself is something called an edicule. When you walk in, it's incredibly beautiful, the structure. This is a beautiful structure. This is the first chamber you visit. Beautiful ceiling, uh, mosaics. And, you know, there, and you, when you look at the steps and just all the stonework, you realize, you know, this, this place is very, very old. And what happens is you can go up high, and this is what people do. They go up those steps and overlook a hole in a rock, and supposedly that hole is where the cross was located, Jesus' cross. Remember I mentioned they brought Jesus to the site. You know, they, they laid him down, and well, where they laid him down is, is supposedly this, this slab. When you first get there, it's one of the first things you see. And, of course, people weep over it and cry over it, and they burn incense around it. And, you know, it's very, very moving. But the special thing is the tomb itself. It's unbelievable. When I was there, it was covered up. A lot of it was covered up. I was able to get inside the tomb. But they have since restored it, done an incredible amount of work. And the entrance is at the bottom. There's a little door there. I kind of went off to the side to just see what else is in that sort of area. I like to kind of go see things. Maybe I'm not supposed to, <laughs> but I kind of wandered around and there were other tombs in that area. And these tombs may have been tombs of the first century. You look up, there's an enormous, glorious skylight and dome. And this is the structure in which Jesus supposedly was buried. It's not very big. You walk into a small chamber, and then you walk into the tomb itself. So there are people going, and like I said, they've cleaned the, the they've cleaned the structure, edicule. It's beautiful. It, I, I did not see that when I was there because it was covered with scaffolding. 
And then you walk through a little door, and there's Jesus' tomb. Uh, you're, you're, you know, one or two people are allowed in it. You have to lean down and get in it. They want you to be in and out, you know, very quickly. And I was able to touch that. It's very moving. Uh, incredibly moving. When they did the renovation, they actually raised, because Jesus is not there, right? So they raised the slab up to see what was beneath. <laughs> and they did some restoration work. And, of course, Jesus was not there. Uh, he was probably laid on top anyway, but they wanted to see what's beneath. And this was done under strict supervision of, you know, all those different sects. They did agree to this, which is hard to believe. They can't move the ladder, but they agreed to find out what's in the two. There it is. And there's the church. But is that the location where Jesus was buried? Maybe not. Uh, in the, as early as the 1700s, people were visiting Jerusalem, and many, particularly Protestant groups, said it can't be where it was. It was somewhere else. And they list a lot of reasons. Was the really what the description in the Bible could apply to another location? And this other location is called the Garden Tomb. And it is much further north. Uh, you're seeing in white the lines of the old city, but those the, the the you know the fortress wall. But those those walls have moved over time, and so uh, Temple Mount is in the upper right in the distance, and people believe maybe this is it, maybe this is where he was buried, the Garden Tomb. Part of that is. The, the word Golgotha means the place of skull. Well, look in the very middle of the rock outcropping. Do you see a skull? Well, I'm going to give a close-up of it. It's straight ahead. You see maybe two eyes. So that's the place of the skull, and this garden is nearby. Okay, now do you see the skull? So is that the place of the skull? <laughs> Looks like it to me. And it may have survived all these years because the early Christians did not get it right. We, we, you know, we don't know. The early Christians may have thought he was buried there, and he was, you know, he was crucified there and buried there. But he may have been buried here, and then he may have been crucified here and then buried nearby the skull and this is the way it looks now uh is is that the place that's pretty compelling i did not visit the garden tomb but i found out a lot about it and it, it basically uh particularly in the 1800s and then into the 1900s uh people are saying you know <clears throat> the, the place that uh the holy sepulcher is is kind of a joke it's a folly it's a it's a made a glorious kind of mistake. And Jesus was buried in a much place like this, further away from the Temple Mount. And that's just the way it is. And for many denominations, many Protestant denominations, and the Church of Latter day Saints believe this is where he was buried. This is where he was crucified. But well, where was he buried? He was buried in this tomb. A small opening on a hillside. And as time has gone by, people will meet there. The debate, as I said, I've told you about controversial things, unresolved things. This is a biggie. It could have been in a different location. Uh, but there is a garden and there's a tomb. You go inside, it has a you know gate around it, and there you see where the body would have been laid color picture of it apparently there's some markings on the wall i'm not sure when that was made who knows but people visit it and if you go to jerusalem i know many of you are going to jerusalem uh shortly and i don't know if this is in, do you know god if this is included yes. well that's great 
because I urge you to uh, go see it. And then you have to, I guess. What? And you visited it. What do you think? Did you get into the tomb uh, in the Holy Sepulchre? But you went into the building, right? Yeah, you went in the building. Well, yeah, it was hard because there's always a line to get in it. And I went like at five o'clock in the morning to get in with the first group of, of uh, Roman Catholics. But it's an incredible structure. Go ahead. I think reflecting back on that first trip that Tom went on and others here, uh, I think one of the challenges is not only that the church of the Holy Sepulchre is so over touristy, but the piety that's on display there from Greek Orthodox, Armenian, Coptic, uh, even Roman Catholic is different than our piety. So there's a lot of icons, there's incense, there are guys with funny robes, you know, all of that. And so that's not how kind of we experience uh, our faith. And so in Martin tomb, it's run by English folks, and they, Protestants, and they walk you through and they say things like, you know, we don't, we don't venerate a place, we come to worship the person. Uh, we're not here for a holy site. We want to talk about the Savior. And it's a very different experience. Um, and that's generally where we have communion at the garden, too. And the thing about it is they're within walking distance of one another. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, the, the folks who decided on the garden, too, said, well, the Bible's really clear. It's outside the gates of the city. Well, the gates of the city moved, and when when Helen determined where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was, it was outside of the gates at that time. So, you know, it's it's really a number, but it's a busy place. And uh, I was recently reading an article where, what you said about Helena established a place outside the walls, but there's debate about that too, that the the location of the walls in that vicinity may have been that Golgotha where this is located may have been outside the walls or it may not have been outside the walls. And if it was not outside the walls, then that's, that's it couldn't be the location because it's very clear in the Bible. He was buried outside the walls of the city. Uh, Guy also mentioned the, uh, the piety of people there. You know, it's incredible. Although the Ethiopians live on the roof <laughs> in these, in these kind of stone huts and and they have like you know a little uh little microwave they've got electricity and they've got a little aerial uh, tv uh, you know a little dish to get tv it's just wild um so visiting it to me was an incredible experience and i also mentioned presentation earlier about the last supper uh there's a room in jerusalem called the Last Supper, where it's impossible to be the space because of the architecture it includes Gothic arches and other things that, you know, historians know that was way after the time of Jesus. But people get very emotional there, too. So I urge all of you, if you haven't been to Jerusalem, please go. And I'll close with this image, which is something that occurs in this I believe in Easter every year, which is called the Holy Fire. And it's a ceremony where, you know, people light from one candle, light other candles. And it's, I'm, I'm sure it's a very religious, very moving ceremony. Uh, and of course, at the right time, sunlight comes in the space and it's absolutely glorious. Thank you for listening. That's all I have. And I know uh, I, I may have gone too fast in some of the slides earlier. You know, I'm always mindful to have time to show all the images and also leave some time for questions. So uh, fire away. Are there questions? Any questions?
Oh, come on. Comments? For those of you who went, uh, what was your experience and what would you say to those who are going uh, about this place in Jerusalem? <coughs> Susan? With the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I mean, you're just packed in a long line of people. You go up to where the, the uh, crucifixion occurred and you stick your hand in the box and you rub it and then you keep going and then you go and it's just masses of people. It's it's so touristy. It just doesn't have any sort of, I had no religious feelings or what Since time I'm what sensitive. time did you visit and how long were you in this the building i was probably in the about an hour we did go up on the roof and see the armenians or the ethiopians, or ethiopians whoever was up there <laughs> um I, I we were probably there an hour i don't know what time we went maybe in the morning we were at saint anne's or something and then walked up the via dolorosa Ro um so maybe midday well the uh fortune I had is that uh, my Jewish guide got me in the day and and it was like you said it was very crowded but then I went back that next morning you know at five o'clock and I was there with the exception of a small group of Roman Catholics that were going in the tomb you know there were maybe 10 people in there and it was very it was a different experience you know it's like kind of, kind of going to a beautiful gothic church like Notre Dame or places like that Chartres uh and being in a structure like that when there are very few people in it you know the acoustics are different everything just feels different um so if those of you that are going to go let me know what you uh <laughs> how the experience goes okay some other questions and it clearly the, the different parts of the day had a different experience um when we went in the afternoon with a larger group it's a little crazy. I mean, in fact, I remember our tour guide said, you can't act like Westerners. You've got to and be polite and let people in you. If you don't push forward, you'll never get in that place. And so, you know, we had to wait in that line that kind of circles around that you can see in that picture. But it's very uncomfortable that, you know, it's about a crowded place I've ever been in. But another group of us came back early the next morning, about 4 or 5 o'clock, very serene and, and I felt very um uh, to be very very reverent to that. So uh, I really enjoyed that as opposed to that. and and I'll add a large tomb. Um very interesting but very um very peaceful place. And so I failed to mention one thing. Uh the control of the building is by these different not Protestants christian groups but the keys to the building right. reside with two muslim families right they have the big key and they open it up in the morning like at five or something at 4 30 and they close it at night <laughs> and now how did that happen <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> there was a question over here Jonathan. And we went back in the afternoon because the with the whole uh group was as you described just massive people. And so we went back later the day, wasn't quite as bad, but a priest told us when we went back in the afternoon that you can spend the night in the church. You have to get permission from uh, I guess at night the a Catholic priest, but I mean there's no place to sleep. You just have to you know, you sleep on the floor, you bring your own pillow. Well, we didn't want to do that, but he did tell us that it opened up at 4.30 in the morning. So we got up and walked through the deserted streets of Jerusalem. All the shops were closed. It was a totally different experience. And then went into the Holy Sepulchre. And it's the highlight of my entire life. You got inside the tomb? Yes. Well, no, we actually, the tomb was not open. But we, uh, they had the crypt open so we could go and see where Helena found the true cross and where the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the slab, 
yeah, or the the uh, Templars or whatever written on the wall, but that's closed during the day. So, um, but it was just um, that slab that you mentioned, I, you know, that it, where Jesus they'd lay Jesus. But I don't think the tomb opened until later. But we did get to go second, uh, the original time with the group. Amazing. Yeah, when you see the slab that I mentioned, of course, it is beautifully made and beautiful edges and everything. It's probably not where you know, Jesus were really laid. He probably laid on you know stone, some you know flat area, whatever. Uh, let me say uh, two other things uh, about the area. Uh, uh, Susan reminded me when y'all will go, you'll you walk the Via Dolorosa, and one of the places that you'll visit is called St. Anne's, which was a crusader church that has perfect acoustics. And Keith will likely help lead some singing there, and you will be absolutely amazed at uh, the quality of sound. One of my favorite places is over in Bethlehem, the Church in the Nativity. And again, it was established by Helen, and similarly, it can be very crowded especially going down into uh, the site, not unlike Susan, you saying the cross, Susan gone, um, uh, where you can put your hand in a hole and, and touch where I think it was born. But for me, the real uh, experience there was going underneath the church into a grotto underneath where Jerome translated the Bible into Latin. And you can argue whether or not this is the exact spot for the uh, the birth of Jesus, right? That, but you can't argue that that's where Jerome did that, uh, and it became one of the significant things. Uh, you had mentioned Melinda about uh, the Crusader uh, marks, the the graffiti outside of my office. In the office, there is a painting that I have that a, a woman who was a member of my church in Libertyville, Illinois, she was an art teacher, and every summer she would go somewhere on the Mediterranean to paint. And she came home after visiting Jerusalem, and one of the paintings she had all had all of these little crosses in her, and I knew exactly where she had painted that. It was from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to have that. Yeah. Other questions? Comments from anybody? You're letting me off. Yeah. Uh, I, I went on the 2010 trip with Guy. And one of the, first of all, I would say that you won't read or listen to the Bible without getting visual images. Um, it brings it very much alive. But one of the places I felt most moved was actually Capernaum wandering in the ruins of Capernaum, destroyed by earthquake, but in the, the Jewish temple there and knowing the Bible says Jesus visited Capernaum, um, it was very real to me. Yeah, I think some folks really fall in love with Galilee and everything up north, it's sort of quiet, it's not as, um, and then others find Jerusalem, you know, it's, uh, I, I love them both for different reasons, but uh, uh, you're absolutely right. You, I remember when we came back after the first trip and John Semmingson was across the chancel and the reading mentioned Capernaum. We just sort of looked up at each other and caught each other's eyes like, oh, we were there last week. You know, it, it really does make a difference. Yeah. It's an incredible city in that uh, reminding that three major world religions it is the most one of the most important spots and uh and the history there is just incredible and to see the base uh you'll probably go to the west western wall yeah not the wailing wall wailing wall is a derogatory term uh but if you go to the western wall and see the size of the stones and you realize the amount of energy amount of people amount of money involved in building these things and how old they are it's just absolutely stunning yeah i mean as an architect just to think of what it took to build the base of it i was it's just there amazing. six days and i should have been there a couple months yeah. one of the things for for the men 
And when you're at the Western Wall, there's actually a divider and the women have to go on one side, the guys have to go on the other. And sometimes you'll see along that divider uh, chairs. And when uh, they have a bar mitzvah celebration, the women will get on the chair so they can look over at what's happened on the other side. But for the men, if you go to the wall and turn to your left, there's kind of another wall that comes in and there's an opening and you could go in there. I think it's called Wilson's Arch, I think it's called. And there's a little uh, place to study scripture in there. Um, and you should not take a photograph while you're in there, just uh, an FYI. Somebody I know who did that, and they weren't happy, Ken. They didn't come to arrest him, but they weren't happy. Yeah. I take pictures. Yeah. So, <laughs> other questions? Comments? I, I, I again, I, I just think, you know, Helen and to, having these places, uh, for me, it was less about this being the actual place than the thought that pilgrims have been coming to this place since the mid 300s. And, it, and the, the words of those English evangelicals just kind of, it's not the place that we venerate, but the person. It's not the site, it's our savior. And going with, with that kind of pilgrim intention uh, made the, the difference for me in, in these, I, I've been, I think four or five times now, and each time is a little bit different. You, you're talking um, about just how close things are. You hear the Mount of Olives and the Kidron Valley. I, I grew up in a large valley, you know, so when I think valley, I think big distance. Uh, I'm not a great golfer, but I mean, I could hit a nine iron from the top of the Mount of Olives, uh, you know, to the to the walls of Jerusalem, the the Kidron Valley is just kind of down and up. It, it's not far at all. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, so, I'm also available to give this these presentations. The one one I did last week, and this and, and the others. Some of you have seen them to any group. Uh, I love doing it. Uh, you know, I was changing this slideshow this morning. I'm yeah. always trying to keep it as up to date. Of course, the thing that happened on January the third with the Jewish guy getting on the Temple Mount. Whoa! Yeah, it's a big. So the, the story continues. The research continues. Yeah. And, and well, we're grateful that you did it. Thank you so much, Kim, for Thanks. being with us. Grace and peace, all. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize for going maybe too fast. You're going, and you've never met. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it's uh. If you have the chance, go to something called the the Hotel Tunnel. Remember, he was talking about the Western Wall. If I can get a picture, believe me, believe me. Well, uh, I had heard that. 